So let's start with this one. It's a printed dipole antenna. So what is a non-printed, old-fashioned dipole antenna? Old-fashioned dipole antenna, as you know, is this, right? Two wires. How do you feed the antenna? Here. Okay? You feed the antenna here. The resource, plus and minus the resource. This antenna radiates. Or, but you have to always remember, antennas can always work in receiving mode also. So you may wish to connect the resistor here and some magnetic signal is falling on the antenna. Some signal is captured by the antenna and dumped into this Okay, so that's an old fashioned dipole. This is a printed dipole. Okay, let me explain what this is. It's a coaxial input. And you will study all about dipole antennas, but nobody will address this one. What is there and what does it behave like? Okay. At low frequencies, you simply connect the wires and maybe screw them there. At high frequencies, what does it really behave as? At high frequencies, for example, this one is at 3 gigahertz. This will be more important than the rest of it, actually. Okay. So you have to be really careful. This is actually fed from a coaxial cable. You have seen a coaxial cable? Mm -hmm. Like the one we have in the oscilloscope? That kind of way there is a connector fed from that. Now this is the view from the back side. I don't have the view from the top side also, but I do have a drawing of it. This is what it looks like on the top side. The coaxial connector comes here. This is called a micro strip. Have you heard of the word micro strip? Micro strip is a two wire transmission line. Okay. What are the two wires? So there is a dielectric layer, insulating layer, PCB you can say, for support. One of the wires is the back side, which is a big hard ground, and one of the wires is the top side, which is a strip, metallic strip. Okay. By choosing thin strip or thick strip, you can achieve something. That's called a micro strip. Important part is two wires. One wire, two wire. Current goes and comes back. So it can match with a coaxial cable. Okay, the coaxial cable also has two wires. Center conductor, outer sheet. Current goes and comes back. So it can be connected easily here. Not so with a waveguide. Waveguide is one wire transmission line. So there are some complications there. This is the top, this is the bottom. You see, in this region, it's a micro strip. Top strip, notice some things are happening in this strip. Okay? It's not the uniform strip. And there's big metal. But this big metal doesn't go on being big metal all throughout. There's something here, something poking out, and then there's a shape. It is actually the dipole. How is it fed? It's a non contact feed. See this hook kind of structure, it falls here. Okay? And the electromagnetic signal is coupled between this and this, and that radiates. Plus, there are these funny looking things poking out. All in all, you can see it's a kind of a complicated thing. Okay? The dipole is also not straight, it is bent. Why do we have such a complicated thing? It's the use of this. <coughs> The use of this is this. What is this? Have you seen plots like this? Hmm? It's called the radiation pattern, but have you seen these kind of figures? Okay. Loosely speaking, for those who are not familiar, this shows how the radiated signal from the antenna is distributed angularly. Okay. Signal always follows the inverse square law. As you go twice the distance, the power density has to fall off as, you know, as will fall by one fold. But the angular distribution is very specific to the antenna. Some antennas distribute the power uniformly in all directions. Okay? If it is ideal in all directions, exactly equal, then it's called an isotropic antenna. There is no such thing in real life. It's a hypothetical thing, mathematical only. But some of them concentrate, in, concentrate the power very 
uh, in a sharp uh, uh, small angular region those are it's called a pencil beam okay? pencil small angle this particular antenna was designed to have the power distributed very almost uh, equally throughout a very large angle but not 360 degrees idea was from plus minus plus 90 to minus 90 in terms of the figure this direction this direction this 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 i should have equal power almost everywhere and certainly no power in the back side now that doesn't happen you know things in real life doesn't don't happen like that there is rarely such an abrupt change everything uniform and suddenly zero it doesn't happen like that what happens is this the black figure is more meaningful yeah. but you see it's not bad i would have liked this thing to go to zero ideally like this but there is this thing you know what this is called yeah. it's called a back low okay so this particular antenna was meant to achieve this where is it used it's a, this one is actually used in uh, have you heard of AWACS AWACS airborne early warning and control systems okay. so military people use such things they use uh, radar mounted on an aircraft okay and uh, these aircrafts will be flying near the border or somewhere and if there is enemy aircraft anywhere they constantly searches for enemy aircraft enemy missiles and there are many such aircraft linked to satellites linked to ground stations it's like an electronic fence so that at an early stage of war if you have detected an incoming missile or an incoming hostile something then you will have an early war the Indian military spends enormous amounts of money to develop those. This is one very tiny little part of that. Okay. A AVAX radar, they require an antenna which can scan the beam over a very large angular extent. The larger the better. RFI, the radio frequency identification. A lot of companies are spending enormous amounts of money in research and also making products. They are also very useful. RFID radio frequency identification. So this is a 900 megahertz RFID antenna. Looks very complicated, right? Here, the specialty is the fee. As I told you, we have a lot of antenna textbooks, but they really talk about the fee. Here, the field is a two-wire field. Okay? What do I mean by that? I mean that there's a chip, a tiny little chip. It's barely visible there inside that gap okay. on this chip there are two pads and that's the input and output okay. these are to be connected to a 900 megahertz antenna there is a technique called wire bonding by which you connect these pads to an antenna okay. these are very small you cannot see them with just the eye you use a microscope so there is a machine to connect I think wire these bags to some structure outside so that's what this antenna is okay. and normally you say the input impedance of the antenna what should it be 75 ohm cable or 50 ohm cable in this case it's about it should be 6 plus j200 that's what the input impedance should be because that's the output impedance of the chip conjugate of course uh, strictly speaking, Z out is equal to 6 plus J 200. So, what should be the output? Uh, what should be the antenna input impedance? Hmm? It should be 6 minus this conjugate match. Have you heard about conjugate matching? If you want to get maximum power out, have you heard of the maximum power transfer theorem? Yes. You have to conjugate match. Remember, yes. the load has yes. to be ZL is ZS conjugate. So the antenna input impedance should be 
thing. Minus J. So this is a very special antenna designed for that purpose. So that at 900 megahertz between these two terminals, you achieve that impedance. Not only that, this antenna is mounted. This was actually for a automotive car application. The cars uh, go through some toll collection stations at highways. Have you seen? Yes. Sir. For example, near Delhi, uh, if you go to the Gurgaon and Rajasthan side, there are some toll collection stations. Yes, sir. Okay. So there they use things like this. Okay. So this is what it looks like. It's actually being tested in a car. In that case, the antenna doesn't work by itself. You have to remember that behind this thing is a very big piece of glass. It totally alters the antenna properties. Okay. So the antenna has to be optimized for operation inside the car. If you take the same antenna and try to see how it works inside your laboratory, inside an antenna testing chamber, it will not work well at all. That's because it was designed to be operated in this environment, stuck to the windshield interior. And of course, we tested it out. This is some little work done for Mitsubishi company, the Japanese company. They were very keen on developing all kinds of things. So that's an RFID antenna. There are all kinds of RFID antennas. Okay. Sometimes people use the term antenna a little misleading. You. For example, you may hear of RFID antenna working at 100 kilohertz. It's not antenna. Okay. At 100 kilohertz, what they use is one coil of wire on the transmitter and one another coil of wire on the reader. And they call it an antenna pair. But it's not antenna, it's actually primary and secondary of a transformer. Okay. That's what it is at 100 kilohertz. Okay. So that's another kind of RFID. If you wish to call it an antenna, you can call it an antenna. Whatever it is, it's main means of getting signal across without using wires, okay. not contact technique. This one is at 900 megahertz, there are three other frequencies also used. So it's another kind of antenna. This is called a reconfigurable antenna. This is under development, it doesn't work well yet. This particular antenna, again, the microstrip type, and but then something else happens. Okay. All of these are non-standard. There is no design formula. Okay. Days and days, hundreds of hours on the simulators. This antenna, they apply a signal from here. And there are two diodes. Inside. These diodes, when they are biased on, when current flows through the diode, it's as if it's a short circuit. Right? If it is biased off, it's like an open circuit from a small signal point of view. What is the small signal? It's the main RF signal. Okay. So when the diodes are biased on or off, the whole antenna behaves differently. How does it behave? It's a little difficult to see. I'll be able to see. This figure has three curves. This is the S11 of the antenna, the reflection. S11 very low means the antenna is working. S11 low means no reflection, with power is going out, being regulated. S11 very high, close to 1 or 0 dB, means the antenna is not working. Whatever power comes in goes right back. <coughs> now, if you wish to understand this antenna operation, there are three curves here. Are you able to see the three curves? There's a blue one, there's a black one, and there's a green one. Three of them. The black one is when both of them are off. Okay? When both the diodes are off. In that case, it's a dual frequency antenna. 2.5 and 5. By the way, these are both the used frequencies. 2.5 and 5. Some they use terms like hyperlan and uh, Wi Fi and God knows what. These computer people, you know, nowadays you talk about LANs and wireless LANs and things. So they, there are actually standard frequency ranges. 
and these are the actual user interfaces. So the black one, both of them are working. Both frequencies, the two frequencies. The blue one, one of them is on, the other one is off. The blue one only works at this five, five degrees. See, here it doesn't work. It's gone up. The green one works only there. Here it is. What is this yellow portion? It's the backside ground. Backside metal. The gray is the front side metal. Blue. This yellow is the backside metal. So up to this point, it's a microstream. After this point, it's a something funny. There is no back metal. There's just some wire here. Or tracks here. Non standard. This is what? Use of this Bias choke. It's called an RF choke. So the RF signal This one? Yeah. It's a bias choke. Yeah. So that the RF signal, if you don't use a bias choke, then RF signal anyway is going to interfere here. So these biasing things are always decoupled with an RF choke. <coughs> okay. So this is what time. However, it doesn't work very well. The idea was that this antenna should be operable in either this frequency or that frequency or both. Okay. How do you turn both of them off? Zero bias. Both are off. Positive bias, one of them will be on. Negative bias, the other. Well, we are somewhere there, but it's not real because I would like to have zero dB here. So when this level goes to that level or that level, it is not working very well, but it's still working. I should like these levels to be there. Something we have not yet been able to achieve, but it's something. It shows at least that there is hope. Possible to do this? Ground plane is associated with the same thing? No, ground plane is as usual the opposite side of the substrate. I'm not able to show that very clearly. Between the grey and the yellow, there is the substrate. The substrate and ground are the same thing. Yeah. Well, it's not correct. You know, it's not shown that way. Between the yellow, yellow is the ground. Then the grey is the track. Between them, there is the substrate. Is it electric metal? Is it a kind of? Huh? What is the name of diode? It's a pin diode, very high frequency pin diode, chip diode actually. Okay. Not a package diode, it's the actual bare diode chip. Okay, this is the next one. This is a UW band. And have you heard of UWB? Ultra wide band. Okay. See, this is. Standard question, you know, some of the students you may go for interviews someday, they may ask you, why do we use antennas? Why do we modulate a signal using such high frequencies? Long distance, long distance. Hmm? Long distance. Long distance has nothing really to do with it. The distance part is different because whatever frequency we use, inverse square law applies. Okay? So distance is not really so directly related to frequency. What? Why do we not use one kilohertz? Size of the antenna. Okay. Size of the antenna. So that is the reason why, if we wish to transmit our speech, for example, using wireless, we cannot do it because our speech is low frequency kilohertz. Okay. And if you directly take our speech, transfer it to electrical domain. Amplify that electrical signal, amplify it a lot, and try to transmit it through an antenna. It's not going to work because you require an antenna which is kilometers in size, wavelength at kilohertz. So what we do is modulate. Okay, take our speech, modulate it with a megahertz or a gigahertz signal. Then modulation in uh, you know the time domain. What does it correspond to in frequency domain? Do you remember that? Modulating means multiplying by a sinusoidal signal. 
In frequency domain, what does it do? What does it do to the spectrum? Shift it. Okay? The spectrum is shifted. But the shape of the spectrum is not altered. It's only shifted. So if you transmit the new spectrum, which is at a very high frequency, and then you can back shift it, just demodulation, you get back nice speech. Okay? The idea is that the size of the antenna should be of the order of wavelength. Okay? Maybe half wavelength, maybe quarter, but not one millionth of wavelength. This won't work well. Now this is the standard thinking. That's why we modulate. But nowadays there is another type of thinking. What if we don't modulate? Okay? So if we have to because everybody uses digital signals nowadays, okay? So if you have to transmit a digital signal earlier, this was my digital signal, zero and one. I would modulate it. Then zero be zero and one I would make this. Again zero. This. And I can transmit that signal. It's modulated. It's called ASK amplitude shifting. I can transmit it. But nowadays another thinking is that instead of transmitting this, what if I transmit just a single pulse. Why modulate? Why not transmit just a single pulse? Then I can transmit at enormous data rate. If the single pulse is sub nanosecond, okay, because that's how far the technology has grown. You know, clock pulses in computers, they're sub nanosecond now, they're 3 gigahertz clocks. Mm. In that case, you can see this is sub nanosecond, see how much the data rate can be, gigabits per second. At that rate I can transmit information. That is UWV, unmodulated microwave transmission. What kind of an antenna do I need? Well, I have to look at the spectrum of this. What is the spectrum of such a pulse? It's a very broad spectrum. A narrow pulse has a broad spectrum. So, some people have got together and agreed that the range 3 to 10 gigahertz with many more restrictions can be used for such transmission. So, these pulses have to be shaped such that their spectrum is in this range. Okay? And indeed that can be done. This is an antenna to cover that. Now, there are obviously, since it's important, so dozens of antennas have been developed to cover this range. So, this particular one doesn't have anything very special, uh, no great advantage over other ones, but it does work. You can see it covers the entire range. This is S11 again, okay, well below 0 dB, actually below 10 dB for practically all of the frequency range, measured also. Radiation pattern is also a very nice, smooth pattern. Okay. So this is UW. That's a standard, that's a convention. Okay. How small? When I say S11 should be very small, then only I can say antenna is working well. How small is very small? Worldwide convention is 0 0.1 is small. Uh, sorry, not S11.1, S11 10 dB, minus 10 dB. is small. Minus 20 dB is even smaller, it is good. Okay. 10 dB means 10% of the power goes to that, 90% dB. That has been taken as a benchmark. Okay. S11 equal to minus 10 dB means one tenth of the power coming back. Okay. Means 90% is going as radiation. That is being accepted as the a good benchmark for a useful antenna. Very, uh, very small gain. For UWB antennas, we don't want gain. They don't work with gain. They are supposed to be omni type of antennas. Okay. How do we use? What is the point of this? How do we develop a system using such communication? That's a big topic, you know, UWB communication systems. Very interesting things have been developed. This is only a small part of it. This is the antenna. Antenna is not the very important part of it. Important part is how to generate such pulses, 
how to separate this pulse from that pulse because there may be many transmitters and many receivers operating in this one room in UWB environment. So how does the receiver know whether this pulse came from that one or that one? So those are all system aspects. So this is a, another type of antenna, UWB, ultrawideband antenna. Actually we did some work on UWB generation and transmission. This is not that particular antenna, but another antenna, they also made numbers. So this is a normal pulse generator circuit, the data generator, one zero generator. It's converted into UWB there, transmitted and received. It's just to test that thing well. You can see that and we see a GW signal. But you can also see that something bad has happened to it. Okay? The UWB pulse which was generated looked like this. What was received looks like that. Major distortion in the pulse shape. Okay. So these are the issues which we have in UWB, which people are trying to sort out. Generated pulse also have a picture. This is the generated UWB pulse. This scale is 2 nanosecond here. So you can judge the size of that pulse. Okay. So that is the generated pulse and if you are able to see that CR, you can see the received pulse. Why the interest in this UWB all of a sudden? Because technology has developed, I have antennas which can do UWB, I have computer clocks which are generating UWB already inside narrow pulses. I have a CR, okay? the old fashioned CR but a very good expensive one, it works after 12 gigahertz. So I can actually plug in the signal and see the pulses, the 3 to 10 gigahertz spectrum pulses in the CRO. Okay. Earlier you didn't have such CROs, now you have them. That's why since the technology is there, so people are trying to use it now. So this is the other thing which we are thinking about. You want to ask me something about these? Or? Okay.